All right, guys, so we are going to go through some notes here. Um, so hopefully you are on the correct slide. Right now it is a blank slide because I haven't actually uploaded the video yet, but you should be watching this and then filling in your notes in the OneNote. Unlike the last times I was out, I had those notes pre-filled in for you, but I do want you guys to actually follow along with the video um, this time because I know some of you did not last time. So uh, we'll go ahead and jump in. Again, there's going to be some questions for you guys to answer throughout the slides um, after you have listened um, to this video. So please go back and answer those questions or you can pause this video and answer the questions as we go. All right, so containment is what we're going to talk about today. Um, to give you a brief overview and reminder of what we were talking about um, last class, actually let me go all the way back to this map here. Um, we have the rise of the communist East versus the West, which would be um, America and the capitalist nations that you can see here in blue. And they're sort of separated by what we call the Iron Curtain, uh, which is the symbolic split in Europe. It's not an actual wall, uh, but the symbolic split between the East and the West or the communist and the capitalist. And this is really the bread and butter of what the Cold War is all about. So uh, what we are gonna look into today is this idea of containment, where again, the great fear of the capitalist Western nations is that the communist Eastern nations want to continue to spread. They wanna continue to make their influence known and to take over all of Europe and eventually all of the world. And so the Americans and the democratic Western nations are gonna come up with a plan of what they call containment to contain or stop the spread of communism. So let me get to our actual notes here. So uh, containment is this uh, belief that uh, the Western nations that the, like I just said, the Soviet Union wants to spread communism across the world. And so they want to stop that um, from happening. Um, so Truman, who is the president by this time um, is, uh, going to and him and his advisors are going to come up with this plan of containment again to contain or to stop the spread of communism okay and so here are the advisors some people that you might see in fact in our exit ticket george marshall is the one who is giving the speech that you will be reading from uh, but we can see here dean atchison and george keenan actually i think your exit tickets from george keenan uh anyway uh but we can see here again both these images stalin the the guy who is the leader of the Soviet Union, who your song was about for the hook. He is reaching over Europe. He's trying to spread communism. Or in this one, again, Stalin, he's the guy with the big bushy mustache. Uh, he's a spider. He's trying to weave his web all across the world. And eventually we can see here across the United States. Um, and of course, the greatest fear is if it comes to America, will that be the downfall of our country, right? Is this tomorrow America under communism? So we'll talk about that more later this week. We talk about the second red scare. All right, so the Truman Doctrine, like we just said, Truman was the president uh, during the late 1940s, early 50s. Um, and so the first attempt at containment is what we call this Truman Doctrine. So it is designed to stop the spread of communism, specifically into two areas, Greece and Turkey. So basically, let me um, show you guys here, um, Greece and Turkey down in this map, uh, we can see all these other Eastern countries that have formed um, uh, the satellite states of the USSR or the Soviet Union. And so the fear is, hey, what if the next two that are likely candidates for this to continue are Greece and then eventually Turkey, uh, these sort of gateway areas. And the reason that in particular there's a big fear is because Greece and Turkey were hit really hard at the end of World War II. Um, and typically, if you have a lot of people who are worried about their economic situation, maybe they're jobless, they don't have money, um, then they might turn to communism, seeing as an opportunity to improve their life and improve their situation. So what is our plan? How are we going to contain that spread? Well, we are going to give aid to the free people of Greece and Turkey. So we can see $400 million in aid. Um, that's gonna be military aid, economic aid, and it's gonna literally just help boost those countries and hopefully make them align to democracy and capitalism rather than communism. Okay, moving on. 
Um, so you can pause here if you'd like to respond to that question. What is the Truman Doctrine? So next up, we have the Marshall Plan. So again, uh, similar thing. You're more at risk to fall to communism or to look for a new economic situation or a new government if your economy and your government's not doing well. And well, quite frankly, most of Europe is ruined after World War II, right? Quite literally in ruins from all the bombs and battles. So Truman is going to fear that these other European nations, that they might want to turn into communist governments, seeing the allure of people being provided uh, with jobs and money and things like that by the government. So the Marshall Plan is basically the Truman Doctrine on steroids. The Marshall Plan is even more economic aid um, to revive the economies and strengthen their governments. We're talking about $30 billion, which again, in today's money, is actually not even that much. But um, back then, that was a considerable amount um, and a lot of aid. And so we can see here, let me actually go to this. Um, you can see these are this map shows amount of money in millions given to these democratic nations. And you can see literally how the money is being given to these countries that were on the Western side. So countries like Poland or East Germany or Czech, Hungary, none of them are receiving that money because they have already fallen to communism, right? But all the democratic Western countries, they are receiving lots of aid. Okay, here we can see again, literally Europe in shambles um, after the war. So this is going to help these uh, Western Europe achieve self-sustaining economic growth, right? If they're, they're going to take our money, invest it into their own economies, and become more successful on their own. Afterward, it's also going to boost our prosperity because, hey, we're literally, if there's companies that are functioning and working in Europe, well, now we have more people we can sell to. So it's going to help our economy as well. Um, and it's going to help build really strong alliances between the U.S. and these other democracies. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a moment. But we can see um, also on the chart, most of our money went to countries like the um, United Kingdom and France, um, which today are still two of our strongest allies, um, especially military allies. Moving on. So again, if you want to pause, you guys can answer the next question describing the Marshall Plan. Okay, um, so... Let's talk about the formation of NATO. So Truman, he wants to create a permanent military alliance um, that will forever exist um, after this uh, World War II. And basically, as in, the idea is to prevent future wars in Europe. And so essentially, they are going to form NATO. And this alliance is still going to exist, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Um, Stalin is going to create his own treaty organization to counter NATO um, to basically say, hey, let's make sure if NATO countries attack the Soviet Union that we can have our allies be able to respond in like fashion. So the Warsaw Pact is formed in Warsaw, Poland, and this is pact means agreement. So it's the Warsaw Agreement where they make this military alliance between the communist countries. Um, and so we can see here um, at the height of NATO, this map sort of shows how far in extent that NATO and its allies were. And we can see in this map, the Warsaw Pact, um, Soviet Union and all of its satellites that were all again, um, against one another. And so we have these two giant alliances that if it came down to war would be willing to fight um, one another. Um, and also worth mentioning again, Warsaw Pact no longer exists. Uh, but NATO does still exist, and again, NATO has not directly gotten involved in this conflict in Ukraine currently, uh, but NATO, the way it works is if you attack one NATO country, then that is considered an attack on all NATO countries. And so if, for example, France was attacked by Russia, then all NATO countries would declare war on Russia. Moving forward. Oh, and actually, here's another map that shows at the toward the end of the Cold War, just how much of the world uh, was aligned to one side or the other. And so that really shows how much of a just complete worldwide conflict this would have been if the Cold War ever turned into a hot war. Okay, um, so let's talk a little bit about this, the National Security Act. So in 1947, the United States is going to pass the National Security Act, which is going to create several um, departments we are familiar with. 
So Department of Defense, which you guys have seen with the Pentagon here, um, which is actually the largest building, um, at least in the United States. I don't know anywhere else, but as far as just sheer square footage, and that is going to coordinate the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and all the military branches. Also, they're going to create the National Security Council, which is going to coordinate foreign policy. It's basically a group of all the highest people in um, the government. And so we can see here is an example of the National Security Council when they're meeting um, for the killing of Osama bin Laden. This happened back in 2011, I want to say. And then the CIA is also created by this, um, the Central Intelligence Agency. Intelligence means information about other countries. And so that is designed to spy on other countries. Spying is a really big part of this Cold War. Okay. Um, and you guys have some other questions you can answer. Let's go ahead and go into this. So the U.S. is in sole control of atomic weapons um, through the late 1940s. And then... Um, and this should say 1949, the Soviet Union detonates its first atomic bomb. Um, and so this will start what is called an arms race between the two countries. Arms race is just competing to build the largest military that can destroy the other side. Um, and so there is a secret uh, U.S. report that's going to come up um, called NSC-68. And this is going to result in the development of an even more powerful type of atomic weapon called the hydrogen bomb, which is a thousand, thousand or thousands of times more powerful than regular atomic bombs. Um, and in some cases, we're talking about tens of thousands of more powerful um, even. And both sides will develop those hydrogen bombs as well. And then you get this sort of stalemate conflict where each side is afraid of completely destroying the other side and there you have a uh, hydrogen bomb explosion okay um, so that is it for what we're going to talk about for today you guys can go ahead and rewatch whatever you need to um, and here's your exit ticket prompt uh, where you'll read from George Keenan here and respond write me a quote sandwich and then again whatever time you have left today you guys can work on your glossary or for ap students you guys can go ahead and watch chapter 28 have a good good one guys i'll see you tomorrow